Well, welcome uh, to all uh, NCWA members to a special program this uh, June that we've just put t together. You know, one of the good things about, one of the few good things about the pandemic is our going virtual has allowed us to uh, offer programs outside our usual season. And we're happy to do that now on the important topic of Iran uh, and the JCPOA. Um, I hope everyone's having a good summer, whether you're, you're still in Naples or Southwest Florida and, or uh, elsewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, the way I am. You know, one of the first NCWA lectures I attended way back in 2015 was on the just signed Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that limited Iran's nuclear development. Our speaker, who was Joseph Cinceroni, who's been back to, to talk to us since then, expressed optimism about what that the JPC, uh, JCPOA meant for non-proliferation and stability in the Middle East. Six years later on, I reflect on that optimism with nostalgia and confess to perhaps a touch of naivete. The U.S. has resigned from the JCPOA and has expanded sanctions. Iran continues to incite provocations across the region and to accelerate its, its uranium enrichment program. So this issue the current fulcrum of our long fraught relationship with Iran continues to be a critical challenge for US foreign policy and it demands our attention. To focus that attention, we're fortunate to have two wise experienced observers of the Middle East with us here today. I look forward to their remarks. I thank you for being with us and I'll now turn to Mimi Gregory to introduce them. The Naples Council on World Affairs welcomes Suzanne DiMaggio, chairman of the Quincy Institute, and senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East and Africa. She also directs the U.S.-Iran Initiative. The Council also welcomes John Brennan, former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and distinguished fellow at the Center on National Security at Fordham Law School. A senior intelligence and national security analyst for NBC and MSNBC, his latest book, Undaunted, My Fight Against America's Enemies at Home and Abroad, is a memoir of his career in public service. On the eve of the Iranian presidential election, June 18th, we are so very fortunate to hear their assessment of the possible success of a reinstatement of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. With a high degree of mistrust between Washington and Tehran, and the political jockeying in this highly charged issue, we look forward to a robust discussion with Suzanne DiMaggio and John Brennan. Thank you for joining us. So Suzanne uh, DiMaggio, you are in the midst of the Vienna talks aimed at the reconstitution of the JCPOA, which you describe as slow going. Would you kindly start our discussion on this challenge for us this afternoon? Well, thank you so much, Mimi, and thank you to all for having me. It's really a pleasure to be part of this event today. Um, before we get to Vienna, I thought it might be helpful to start with a brief history of the JCPOA, just to position it into uh, what is actually happening in Vienna. Um, I think many people know that it was a deal that the Iranians reached in uh, July 2015. Uh, this was after 35 years of hostilities with the United States. Uh, the deal is officially known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action or the JCPOA. Uh, the deal was the result of painstaking diplomacy between the P5 plus one group. That includes China, France, Russia, the UK and the US plus Germany and Iran. So this process of diplomacy began in earnest quite some time ago, back in 2003. During that period, it was mainly European-led efforts over the course of more than a decade, followed by intense U.S.-Iran diplomacy from 2012 to 2015, which started with secret talks in Oman. So this was a deal that took years uh, to put in place. Uh, and it's not a wonder that we're having some difficulty in Vienna getting to the finish line in such a short period of time. I think it's important to remind all the viewers that the JCPOA had one goal, and that is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear bomb. 
The focus is on the single issue. It was deemed to be the most critical and frankly, the most threatening to US interests. It's an ambitious goal in and of itself, but this deal was not meant to cover Iran's missile program, its regional activities. It wasn't meant to be a transformative deal. It was actually quite transactional. Uh, the deal radically reduced Iran's uranium enrichment capacity. Uh, it stretched breakout time, the time to, uh, it would take to make a single bomb from three months to 12 months. It eliminated the plutonium path to the bomb and it placed Iran under the strongest nuclear inspection system ever negotiated. So the real innovation of this deal is unprecedented international verification provisions aspects of which could perhaps be a model for North Korea if we could get there with them and be so lucky. Uh, so in exchange for Tehran rolling back its nuclear program through strict limits, the US and other world powers agreed to suspend some in, uh, economic sanctions. At the same time, it's important to remember that other sanctions related to other aspects of Iran's activities namely human rights abuses, terrorist financing, missiles. Have, these sanctions have remained in place uh, throughout this time. Uh, the deal also provided a direct reliable channel of communication with the government of Iran. Uh, I don't think this is mentioned enough when we talk about the deal. This channel served at times as a crisis prevention and a crisis management channel, something we did not have for decades. Uh, the important point I would like to make is everything I just mentioned, all of it was achieved through diplomacy, not through military action. Uh, the deal was forged by President Obama. It indeed uh, is one of his key foreign policy achievements passed on to President Trump. During his presidential campaign, President Trump called the JCPOA the worst deal ever made. He vowed to withdraw from it as soon as possible, and he fulfilled this campaign promise in May 2018. He put in place a new approach. It's called a policy of maximum pressure. Uh, the U.S. then reinstated sanctions against Iran, which brought the U.S. out of compliance with the deal. And to be clear, this is significant because it was the United States, not Iran, that reneged on its commitments to the agreement. So for the first year following the US's withdrawal from the U nuclear deal, the Iranians followed an approach of strategic patience. They continued to fulfill their commitments while looking mainly to the Europeans to find ways to allow them to receive the economic benefits they were promised. Um, and it's also important to know that the Iranians viewed our withdrawal from the deal and the maximum pressure campaign as an all out war on their economy with regime change as the end goal. So in the absence of any progress and after one year's time, the Iranians moved to an approach they called maximum resistance. Uh, this has included a significant ramp up in their nuclear activities. The International Atomic Energy Agency estimates that Iran has now stockpiled more than 10 times the amount of enriched uranium allowed under the JCPOA. Moreover, it is now enriching at more than 60% purity. This is closer to weapons grade and it's far higher than what they were doing when we were in the JCPOA. That was only 3.67% and now they're up to 60. Uh, and while Iran has not yet um, sprinted towards the bomb, maximum pressure has actually increased the Iranian nuclear threat. That much is clear. So following our exit from the deal, we also began to see a sharp increase in tit for tat provo provocations, embroiling us in a dangerous escalatory ladder in the Middle East, including Iranian moves aimed at undercutting international shipping in and around the Persian Gulf, Iranian attacks on Saudi oil facilities, the killing of Iran's could force commander Qasem Soleimani by the US and Iranian retaliatory strikes on, basing, on bases that house American troops in Iraq, which brought us to the brink of war. Uh, there also has been a series of suspicious bombings and fires, which have widely been attributed to Israel at Iranian military and nuclear facilities. 
So as many predicted, when we left the deal, we became locked in a cycle of escalation uh, with the Iranians that nearly led to violent conflict. I am counting at least two times, maybe more. So against this backdrop, it's clear uh, that while we were in it, the JCPOA served as an effective, verifiable non-proliferation agreement. I'd also contend that the agreement was a reliable conflict avoidance and de-escalation mechanism. And America today is less secure without it. So now the current state of play, what is happening in Vienna? So under a new administration, the U.S. is now on course to rejoin the deal. The remaining parties of the JCPOA and Iran have been meeting in Vienna to revive the deal, to facilitate the re-entry of the U.S., and to map out a plan for both the U.S. and Iran to agree uh, to return to full compliance with their commitments. They begin their sixth round of discussions this week. Uh, U.S. officials are also present in Vienna. They're staying in a separate hotel because the Iranians are refusing to meet them at this stage. Uh, so they're following a model of indirect talks. The Europeans and others are shuttling back and forth to facilitate communications between the U.S. and Iran. This, of course, is not the ideal situation. It makes it much harder, but it's what we have to work with. So uh, the parties established three working groups. One is focused on the process for lifting sanctions by the U.S. The second is focused on what steps Iran will take to bring its nuclear program back into compliance. And the third is tasked with mapping out the sequences. How do we move forward once there's agreement? So I would say that the Vienna talks have now moved into their most challenging and critical phase. Uh, progress has been made. And as I said uh, in what I sent to you, Mimi, it's slow going. They're getting down to the nitty gritty of drafting a document that they all can agree to while they continue negotiations on some remaining areas of disagreement. The important point here is both Tehran and Washington agree on the goal of reviving the deal. Uh, this is a consistent position by both the leadership in Tehran and uh, uh, President Biden in Washington. But given the high degree of mistrust in the relationship, the complexities evolved, getting there is not a straight line. So there's some core concerns remaining on both sides. I'll boil it down to just a couple. Uh, one sticking point for the uh, US and the Europeans is how do we handle Iran's advanced centrifuges? Uh, these are the machines used to enrich uranium. They have made progress here. Um, the Iranians want to mothball these centrifuges others would like to destroy them outright. Another sticking point is how do we deal with some of the terrorist designations we place on their Revolutionary Guard and their Supreme Leader? The Iranians, of course, want to see these designations um, revoked. Uh, so that's still on the table. Uh, the US and European powers are pushing to include a mention of follow-on talks that would address Iran's ballistic missile program and broader regional behavior, I think that is going to be take a little more heavy lifting. I'm not convinced that we'll get there. And the Iranians want assurances that the U.S. won't abandon the deal again. I think that also uh, may be out of reach this time, but could be addressed in a future deal. So they've moved to drafting a common text. There's progress. I think the deal is within reach. Both, uh, all sides are aiming to get the best terms, obviously. There are gaps, but I do not think they're insurmountable. Um, now, I think it's really important for us to just consider what happens if we don't succeed in reviving the steel. And I think it seems likely that Iran would seek to increase its own leverage by expanding its nuclear activities, uh, becoming a proliferation risk. Right now, I don't see it as a risk, but it could cross that threshold. I think there would be restrictions on IAEA inspections. I think there would be ramping up of their activities in the region that undermine U.S. interests. Uh, the political dynamics inside Iran are very unsettling. They're preparing for a presidential election on June 18th. Uh, the leadership is moving the country into unchartered political territory. 
conservatives and hardliners are consolidating their power. Um, so after the presidential elections, I think that unless we've made some progress on reconstituting the JCPOA, the Iranians will face fundamental decisions of how to confront what they perceive or will perceive as a mounting alliance against their security. And in such a scenario, uh, the Iranians likely will draw on their growing capacity to fight asymmetrical wars with even better armed proxies. Um, we'll also have uh, their ballistic missile systems to contend with and uh, their hybrid cyber warfare capabilities present a growing threat to, to Iran's neighbors and to our interests. So the picture without the deal is very murky, but also I think could be potentially quite dangerous. So I'll just conclude with some thoughts on the prospects for US-Iran diplomacy. What would follow on talks look like? Say we're able to reconstitute the JCPOA. I think the Biden administration is right, placing the priority on reviving the nuclear constraints first. Um, but my hope is that they also will look at this as a potential strategic opening with Iran to advance other US instances, interests. Uh, for example, reconstituting the deal could clear a path to pursuing other shared objectives, such as negotiating a longer and stronger deal to use the Biden administration's lingo. That would be a follow-on agreement to the JCPOA that would last longer. Also reaching a political settlement to end the war in Yemen uh, developing a regional dialogue and support for the withdrawal of our troops and NATO troops from Afghanistan, uh, setting the stage for perhaps a broader regional discussion to limit ballistic mi missiles and engaging the UN and others in seeking a long-term regional security structure involving the countries of the region and Iran. Um, as I mentioned, one of the first initiatives the Biden team in the foreign policy realm put in place was ending US support for the war in Yemen, support of a political settlement, and more broadly, the pursuit of a US strategic rebalance in the region. Uh, this would entail an end to the previous administration's unconditional support of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we, uh, and with Congress support, it looks like we'll be suspending the sale of some offensive weapons to Riyadh. This is not a break in our relationship with Saudi Arabia. It still holds great value, but it is a course correction. Uh, so the intention to reposition the United States as a stabilizing force, a responsible player in the Middle East, I think is underway. We see the striking of this US strategic balance with Saudi Arabia and Iran as part of a new US approach. Um, we also, uh, unlike the previous administration, we're also seeing that the Biden administration is interested in encouraging an effective mode of mutual engagement, regional dialogue between the countries of the uh, GCC and Iran, and between Riyadh and Tehran more specifically. Um, this will be more difficult to pursue if the JCPOA is revived. And we're already seeing a shift in the political calculations of both Riyadh and Tehran. There's a flurry of diplomacy in the region now, most notably is a nascent but notable dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There is a direct channel. Iraq is playing the convening role. There were meetings in Baghdad at the invitation of the Prime Minister al Qadimi. Uh, in April, we saw a meeting that brought together Saudi intelligence chief and uh, the Deputy Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council. Uh, these discussions reportedly are focused on bilateral issues as well as ending the war in Yemen. Uh, it's very early days. Uh, it's hard to say where they'll go, but it could be an opening that gains traction. So to sum up, I would say that uh, the US, what I've tried to make clear is that our reneging of our commitments to the JCPOA opened up an array of negative consequences that have made us less secure. It's been a blow to diplomacy. It has undercut multilateralism. It has undermined relations with our closest European allies, and it has damaged our credibility. 
Um, I have emphasized the role of diplomacy today because it is my view that the military option is not a viable option. Uh, in the case of the JCPOA, diplomacy worked. Major powers came together to peacefully resolve an issue all viewed as a potential threat, Iran's nuclear program. How often do these powers come together to do anything? Uh, so it's quite remarkable, it should be preserved. Following our withdrawal from the deal, as I outlined, we became locked in a cycle of escalation that has almost resulted in violent conflict. So the JCPOA brought an element of predictability to Iranian foreign policy, by no means a sufficient ingredient, but I'd argue a necessary ingredient, ingredient to building a stable region. We should return to the agreement, join our allies in an effort to reach a similar follow-on deal and extend the JCPOA and in pursue negotiations on the range of issues we have with Tehran that are undermining uh, US interests, some of which I've already mentioned. So I'll stop there and I'll look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so very much. This was just outstanding and uh, certainly draws a picture that uh, says there is much to be gained before we um, can turn the page. Um, John Brennan, you, you reminded us that the going is pretty tough when critics in Washington and Israel point to Iran's support for Hamas. Um, the extremist group is firing missiles uh, between the Gaza Strip and Israel. And uh, the likelihood that a return to the agreement has financial benefits for Iran, which they feel may be used, uh, I quote you, for malign activities. Could you elaborate on some of those issues? Well, thank you, Mimi, and thank you very much for hosting this discussion, which I think is very important. So appreciation to you and the council for doing that today. And I must compliment Suzanne for what I thought was an outstanding overview and a summary of how we've gotten to this point uh, today. And so it's, you know, I'm going to find it difficult to sort of add to what she had said, but let me um, highlight a few points, uh, especially in terms of the context that this effort to try to restart the JCPOA is taking place within. And as Suzanne mentioned, there is the upcoming presidential election in Iran on the 18th of June. The current president, Rouhani, is, has been term limited and he's, not, he's unable to run for the re-election. And it's an important election, clearly. Um, and although um, Iran has the trappings of democracy, it's a facade really because of the limitations that are placed on who actually gets to run in the election. And unfortunately, the Guardian Council which is the council that determines who is eligible to run, has really limited the candidates. And unfortunately, the, uh, the former speaker of the Iranian parliament, Ali Larajani, who is considered to be a moderate and reformist, was excluded uh, by the Guardian Council. Now, it's possible that before the election on the 18th, there could be some changes there because Ayatollah Khamenei um, has said that he thought that some of the individuals who wanted to run were wronged by the Guardian Council, but so far, the Guardian Council is standing uh, strong on that front. Uh, so I, I think it, uh, clearly there's a lot that is going on inside of Iran right now, uh, and eyes are upon that presidential election. Unfortunately, given that it looks as though the, uh, the, just, the Chief Justice uh, Raisi is going to be the, the victor, I think the, the turnout is going to be quite low uh, inside of Iran, uh, unless uh, the Iranian people feel as though they're really being given a choice. So I think that context is very important as those uh, indirect discussions are taking place in Vienna, both from the US side as well as from the Iranian side to see what actually is going to take place on the 18th of June. Secondly then, the Iranian body politic itself you know, has been divided over the course of the past several decades. Iran is a very big country and their, it, the political views both inside the government as well as in society spans the political spectrum. Um, the United States is not the only polarized society these days. Uh, Iran certainly is. There's a divide between the urban and the rural, the younger and the old. Um, but there are a real division of views, I think. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the hardliners, uh, the, the ones that have the instruments of power and have repressed uh, that expression of the public square. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that one of the um, objectives of the JCPOA, which was try to strengthen the hand of the moderates, well, was dealt a very serious setback when the U.S. Uh, pulled out of that agreement. Uh, so uh, again, I think this Iranian society itself is, is divided. I think it's been, in fact, worsened as a result of the United States reneging on the deal. 
because I think there were hopes that the United States was going to be able to bring along, I think, some promise of better times. The economy in, in Iran, uh, which was one of the reasons why the Iranians decided to accept such limitations on such extensive limitations on the Iranian program, uh, when the JCPO was forged, those economic problems have become more severe as a result of the renewed sanctions that have been put on Iran uh, by the Trump administration. So again, the presidential election is taking place. It's taking place in a, in a country where there are divided political views, very strongly divided political views, but the hardliners are uh, ascendant still. Uh, the Iranians also have very important, from their perspective, regional interests that they're going to pursue and want to protect. Um, whether it's uh, they look to their, to their west in, in Iraq uh, or to the east in Afghanistan, and beyond that, uh, they see that they uh, have a number of adversaries, if not enemies, that they need to be concerned about. And that's where I think the hardliners are able to get a fair amount of momentum uh, inside the country by pointing to the fact that Iran's interests uh, are really threatened by a number of these, these forces. Uh, it's why the Iranians for many years have used proxies and surrogates uh, in Lebanon and Syria and Yemen and other areas to continue to try to strengthen uh, their co-religionists, the, the Shia. Uh, and this will, I think, continue to um, fuel a lot of Iranian foreign policy interests in terms of looking at the general landscape in the region. Uh, and so the, the Iranians want to, I think, remain you know, a major player. It's a big, powerful country, uh, but yet it sees that it has a number of challenges uh, in, the, in the vicinity. The fourth issue is on the Biden administration right now. Um, clearly, uh, with the Trump administration out and the Biden administration in, there is at least a real interest on the part of Washington to try to renew the Iranian nuclear deal. And we're very fortunate to have people um, who were involved in the forging of that deal, whether it be Wendy Sherman and Tony Blinken and Bill Burns, Jake Sullivan and others, who really understand all of the details of the JCPOA. I still believe that Donald Trump never understood nor, taught, nor took any uh, interest in learning the details of the JCPOA. It was a campaign promise that he wanted to follow through on in terms of pulling the United States out of that deal. But at the same time, the United States uh, is very, very wary about the uh, Iranian um, efforts over the past uh, year to revitalize their program and to move forward on some of these fronts that really were stalled as a result of the JCPOA. So I, I do think the, the Biden administration is taking the appropriate uh, approach as far as trying to do everything possible to um, renew those obligations that Iran has and not just jumping back into the JCPOA without a understanding that the Iranians are going to adhere to those, those limitations. Uh, on the JCPOA itself, um, it, there really is right now between the United States and Iran an absence of trust, I think, on both sides. The, the fact that the United States really did just turn its back on what had been not just an agreement that the United States signed on to, but one that was endorsed by the Security Council of the United Nations, the P5 plus one, as Suzanne mentioned. Uh, it, almost unprecedented. It sends such a signal uh, that the United States word may only be as good as the prevailing political winds in Washington. And the Iranians are astute observers of the Washington political scene. And they know that elections are coming up in 22 and 24. And they have to ask themselves, even if the Biden administration decided to return to that agreement and to renew the benefits that Iran accrued as a result of it, might they stop again uh, if the Republicans uh, or those who are opposed to the deal uh, come back into power? And so the Biden administration, I think, has to navigate some very important shoals, not just vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but also in the Congress, because it's not just a Republican versus Democratic issue, there are some very uh, well-known and influential Democrats uh, in, on the Hill that were very much um, opposed to the JCPOA as it was initially constituted. Now, I, I do think that there is an effort on the part of the Biden administration to rally that support on the Hill, and I think it's having some traction. But uh, this absence of trust right now on both sides really, I think, is going to prevent any type of you know, quick return um, and it's a question of who is going to move first, whether or not the United States is going to remove the sanctions or whether or not Iran is going to um, go back into uh, uh, following through on its obligations as far as restrictions are concerned. Now, I think it was Tony Blinken who just said today, in fact, that 
the fact that the Iranians have not gone for this breakout um, and that the JCPOA did extend the amount of time that the Iranians would need to produce enough physical material for a warhead, that uh, the work that Iran has done over the last year uh, continues to make that timeline uh, narrower. And that uh, although they may be months away, it could be in fact weeks away if in fact they continue on this path. Now, um, I am concerned that the Iranians you know, continue to inch their way toward a nuclear weapons capability. But I will say that uh, I do not believe that the Iranians are going to do this breakout because it will be quite apparent that they will. And it's going to invite uh, not only international condemnation, and it will, I think, just destroy any chances of the JCPOA being, being revitalized, but also it could, in fact, generate uh, a very uh, um, strong Israeli, even U.S. response uh, to try to prevent that weapons program from going forward. Now, having enough physical material for a warhead does not mean that they then have the capability to deliver a warhead in terms of a, uh, a weapon uh, that could be uh, launched on a ballistic missile, for example. But what you don't want to do is to have the Iranian government, particularly the Iranian government that's in place right now, have the physical material that is required for uh, a deliverable nuclear weapon. Now, as Suzanne pointed out, the Obama administration very intentionally focused that JCPOA only on the nuclear program. Yes, there are many activities that the Iranians are involved in that we have great concern about, uh, and they run the gamut from supporting these various uh, organizations, terrorist organizations in the area, uh, Hezbollah and others, uh, and also engaged in a number of other malign activities uh, throughout the region, as well as cyber activities. But uh, during our discussions in the Obama administration, when it was raised in a number of White House meetings about whether or not the, uh, the focus of this agreement should be broadened, I think President Obama very rightly said that the nuclear program is the most important element of the Iranian weapon system or, 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 or government that we want to stop. And if we were to expand it into ballistic missiles or terrorism or other types of activities or trying to restrict them, we're, we were never going to be able to uh, forge a, a deal on the, uh, that would stop the Iranian nuclear program. And it was always intended to be a building block that once that JCPOA, JCPOA was forged and was agreed to, it could lead to further discussions and negotiations to lengthen the terms of the agreement, maybe even strengthen those agreements, but also look at other areas of uh, Iran's support for terrorism, as well as for other malign activities. Unfortunately, uh, given that we've had now four years of the Trump administration that did its very best to um, undermine that, that agreement, I think we really have been set back quite a bit. And unfortunately, I think the hopes that we had that uh, the JCPOA would boost the prospects of the moderates in Iran, uh, unfortunately, that didn't materialize as a result of the Trump administration's policies. But I do think now we have a chance, and as Suzanne said, I think it's critically important for security and stability in the area to do everything possible to stop and to halt that Iranian march uh, in the direction of a nuclear weapons program. And uh, I have great confidence that not only uh, the White House, President Biden, but also those key uh, individuals in the national security realm are doing everything possible to try to return to that agreement. Again, not do it in a way that is going to be in any way reckless, uh, they're going to be very detail oriented, uh, but I, I do think that we're going to have to see how things come out after the presidential election in Iran uh, in the middle of this month and to see whether or not there's going to be uh, some real progress made toward, again, restarting that, that agreement uh, sometime, I would like to think, uh, this year. Well, thank you also, John, for all your comments. And I think there is plenty of fodder for some very good questions. Jim, would you like to begin? Uh, yeah, I will, and I th I, I uh, echo Mimi and thank you both for uh, for very insightful uh, viewpoints. Uh, Suzanne, I especially liked your historical overview of how we've gotten here. You know, we know in the region that there are there are some uh, governments that are certainly not fans of this deal: the, the Saudis, the Israelis, UAE. Are there some other players in the region that might be more helpful in leveraging this forward? I'm thinking especially of Turkey, maybe Egypt. There might be others. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, there are, I would call them spoilers. There are some, a number of very heavyweight spoilers that do not want to see this deal 
uh, concluded, uh, particularly Israel. But as I, I think I hinted on in my presentation, we have, are seeing a shift among the Saudis and also the Emiratis now. They're both uh, directly engaging the Iranians in dialogue. Um, and um, they, at senior levels, both governments have come out in favor of reconstituting the deal. Uh, so that's progress. Other countries that I think might be helpful, of course, are the Omanis. Uh, the United States worked, worked very closely with the Omanis during the secret talks uh, before the negotiations began. Uh, that was a very productive period. I would contend that without those secret talks that brought the Iranians and Americans together quietly, uh, you know, in a bilateral way, we probably wouldn't even have a JCPOA. It was during those talks that we were able to talk to the Iranians about our intentions, what we saw of the deal, where we wanted to go after, and they did the same. It was foundational. Um, and of course, the Qataris are interested in uh, the joining dialogue on the region and the um, Kuwaitis. Uh, so there are others in the region that um, I think if the deal is in place and if we see Riyadh and Tehran, uh, this dialogue that is just starting out gain some traction, I do think that the stars might align. I don't want to be overly optimistic, but for regional dialogue, and here's my take on this is uh, these are uh, age old um, disagreements that these players in the region have. And it's cer they're certainly not going to be solved by us, the United States. Uh, this is something that the regional powers have to come together and decide what kind of uh, neighborhood they want to live in, uh, how they want to interact with each other. So that's why I do think uh, these initial uh, diplomatic uh, gatherings are so important. And as I said before, what's important now is we have an administration in office that is supportive of this dialogue. They're not um, certainly leading it. They're not in the middle of it, but they're encouraging it from the sidelines very quietly. And I think that's very important. I would just add that obviously all of the major players in the region have taken note of the, the change in administration in Washington, D.C. And so in the past, a lot of those leaders were playing to the Trump administration to try to get on the good side. And they knew that the Trump administration was opposed to the JCPOA. And I think they positioned themselves accordingly. Now that the Biden administration is supportive of trying to revitalize the JCPOA, I think you're just going to be seeing uh, a number of moves in the direction of not actively opposing that effort, but trying to ensure that if there's going to be a restart of that, that uh, agreement, that at least their uh, interests and equities and concerns are going to be taken into account. And so, yeah, it's very interesting to see the Saudi-Iranian interactions. Um, uh, there are a variety of things that the Saudis and the Iranians can talk about. Uh, I don't think the Iranian nuclear program is uh, first and foremost on those discussions. But uh, it, it is helping to, I think, uh, quiet some of those waters. Um, and as Suzanne pointed out, the Omanis were very, um, very instrumental in brokering some of the talks. They, they don't have real influence with the players, but they uh, serve as very, very useful back channels uh, to pass messages. So although the indirect talks are taking place in Vienna, I wouldn't be surprised if there are also some other channels that are alive just the way they were prior to the forging of the JCPOA deal. Judy, um, a question from you. Iran's primary incentive for rolling back its nuclear program is to receive economic relief from the United States, um, which has absolutely crippled their economy. Doesn't that put a whole different look or feel on it from rather than just trying to go back to the narrow uh, agreement in 2015. Aren't they willing to give up a little more or to work a little more or to expand it a little more? I think the thinking on the Iranians part now is to get back into the deal as it was uh, when we left it in 2017, uh, January 2000, well, 2018. Um, they want to roll their program back completely to where it was, which is doable. The steps that they've taken outside of the agreement um, are getting more serious, uh, but I don't think they've reached the limit of, or the risk of a proliferation. 
Um, so it can be reversed. And I think the Iranians have been very clever here. All of the steps they've taken outside of the deal have been done very deliberately with the aim of reversing them. Um, so I think that's very important. Uh, and for the Biden administration, um, you know, they are not going to lift every sanction and every terrorist designation that the Trump administration put on the Iranians. I think it numbers somewhere in the area of 15 to 1700 such sanctions. Um, they have gone through these sanctions with the fine tooth comb. There are the, those that are just not legitimate uh, that they are going to lift and have indicated they will. Uh, there are some that are in a gray area that they're negotiating with the Iranians over. And then there are some that they're absolutely going to keep. What's important to remember here is that the Trump administration, when they slap these sanctions on Iran, um, some of them, in fact, I would say most of them, it was done in a way not to, not only to punish the Iranians, but also to tie the hands of the next American administration. In other words, to make it much harder for the Biden administration to engage uh, the Iranians for the reason John mentioned, the, the, the pushback from certain members uh, of the, on Capitol Hill. So that's where we're at. But it's important to remember that a lot of these sanctions were put on for that reason. Uh, that's why a lot of the parties to the deal see them as illegitimate and uh, want to see them lifted. Um, I think we're almost there. A lot of progress in this working group on sanctions has been made. And I think there's, uh, there's a way forward to uh, finishing uh, that part of the conversation. Now on your point of what these sanctions have done to uh, Iranian, uh, the Iranian population, it is quite serious. Um, you know, these sanctions unfortunately do not tend to hit the elite, the decision makers, but they tend to hit the ordinary people. And that's exactly what we've seen in Iran um, in terms of ac less access to medicine, uh, less access access to food, a lot of humanitarian items. And the other thing to remember is this all happened while Iran was suffering greatly from COVID. Uh, the Iranian people are now, I think, facing the fourth wave of COVID uh, in uh, their country. So this is a dilemma for the Biden administration. And I think we should lay this out because we have now the Biden administration um, uh, distancing, distancing themselves from the Trump administration's approach in words, but not in action. A uh, number of senior officials, many of whom uh, John just mentioned, have been very vocal in making it clear that maximum pressure is a failure, but yet they're still enforcing the sanctions that were part of maximum pressure, which many were issued, say were issued in bad faith to tie the hands of the next administration. So this is a dilemma, I think, for the Biden administration that I, uh, they would like to get over this hump and move forward um, to negotiating a future deal uh, and uh, talk about these other issues that we've brought up. I would agree with Suzanne. I think that most of the Iranian elite or those in the government circles would like to return to the JCPOA as it was earlier constituted. I think there is still a spectrum of views. There are some Iranians uh, on the hardline front that would like to maintain a nuclear weapons program. But the, the, the economic problems that Iran faces are serious. And although the elite is protected from it, they are not insensitive to the domestic uh, impact of these sanctions on the average Iranian. And so I think they're trying to decide exactly how to balance uh, being uh, continue to be seen as sort of revolutionary and opposing any type of U.S. Uh, pressure and uh, pursuing their own interests. Uh, but um, I do think that the, again, the, the Biden administration uh, recognizes uh, the challenges in the internal Iranian political scene and are taking stock of them. Again, you have some very, very knowledgeable and sophisticated national security experts involved uh, as opposed to what happened during the Trump administration. So um, I, I do think that there, uh, I take a, a sense of optimism from Suzanne and I'd like to believe that that is the case that in terms of going forward, uh, because I do think that there is uh, sufficient uh, um, momentum uh, within Iran to try to find that right calibration of uh, returning to the JCPOA uh, without being seen as capitulating to uh, U.S. pressure. 
If I may slip a question in here, uh, John, for you, which is uh, you referred earlier to the favorite uh, for the presidential election is this Ebrahim Raisi, who is apparently a very uh, radically right judiciary member. Um, and the concern that Khamenei has that a low turnout on the vote, um, below 40%, which is the sort of predicted number at this time, suggests uh, that he is terribly concerned that they will never be able to move forward domestically, even with the removal of sanctions, if they don't convince the population that the population has to take a step in this as well. And then the other question that always comes up is, where is the Revolutionary Guard in all of this? Where, where are they sitting? And how might they, in turn, you know, change the picture for any kind of an economic recovery because they will run their own agenda instead? Could you comment on that? Yeah, as you point out, Raisi, I think is, unless something really um, um, unseen happens before the 18th of June, if, as you point out, Khamenei believes that uh, an election that is perceived as um, bogus, basically because of the Guardian Council's uh, disqualifying of a number of those candidates, uh, Raisi looks to be destined to become president. Um, and I, I, I think that right now, um, the Rev Guard, the Besiege, and others are still under the sway and control of the central, you know, power within Iran, which is Khamenei. Now, when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated, Khamenei lost uh, a real lieutenant who was able to basically, you know, carry out uh, Iran's actions and policies, you know, throughout the region. But um, now, Khamenei, as you may know, is he what eighty-two now, I believe. Uh, there's always speculation and questions about his health. Um, that's probably going to be the, the largest uh, uh, perturbation in the Iranian body politic when Khamenei passes from the, from the scene. Uh, Raisi is, is frequently rumored to uh, take uh, Khamenei's uh, place, even though his religious credentials are a suspect. Uh, but I think at this point, Khamenei is really going to be looking at what is going to allow Iran to get through this presidential election without um, any type of uh, problems, uh, protests on the streets that could be seen uh, internationally as um, a, a harbinger of, of more um, you know, uh, political instability in, in Iran. Uh, so I think his uh, Khamenei's statements about you know, questioning the Guardian Council's decision was meant to provide a bit of a vent uh, for some of the criticisms that are out there. Uh, at this point, um, it, they, they had the first presidential debate uh, this past Saturday. What was interesting there, uh, Suzanne, I don't know if you noticed it, but that the, there was no mention of the JCPOA or the sanctions. They were, they were more throwing you know, bricks at each other and blaming each other for all the economic problems in, in Iran. Uh, so uh, again, I, I just have this, this uh, sense of this dynamism inside of the Iranian by politic as we're 11 days or so away from the election. Uh, the things can still happen, but uh, at this point, I, I still see the Rev Guard, the Besiege and others uh, being the, uh, again, the instruments of, uh, of Iran's uh, authoritarian leadership. Uh, and I do not believe Khamenei and others were, are going to allow uh, any type of protest demonstrations to, to get out of hand. Wally, any questions? Yeah, it's hard for me to see what the Russians have to gain by having this agreement go back to its original status. Uh, it would seem to me from their point of view, they love the idea that the US is tied up in all this problem and that uh, the Iranians and the US are not getting along. And the more that happens, uh, the more it's to the benefit of Russia. Uh, on the other hand, if we go back to a, an agreement where the US and Iran are becoming more friendly again, uh, that doesn't necessarily help the Russians at all. So can you comment, both, either or both of you, on you know, what is really the position of the Russians on this and how could they potentially influence the result one way or another? So it's a very good question. And uh, keep in mind, I, I think you'll recall it made big news a few weeks ago. There was a leak of an interview that the foreign minister of Iran, Javad Zarif, had done as part of an oral history project. Uh, that he thought he was doing for an oral history project, but it was leaked. 
And one of the tidbits that he um, did divulge was that the Russians did try to um, derail the original nuclear deal. Um, didn't go into much detail. So I think your, your question is uh, spot on. Um, the Russians are there at the table. Um, they do say they're uh, in favor of this deal getting back, mended together and up and running. Um, but I think they're, they do have uh, um, alternative motives as well. Um, what we have seen with the Russians, and there's no question about this, is when we left the deal, uh, the Russians did move in swiftly to fill a void uh, and to nefarious outcomes. Um, so they may not want to see that end. Uh, but right now, uh, they're at the table in Vienna. Uh, by all accounts, they're playing a um, constructive role. Um, we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Thing that the Russians can stop. John. Yeah, at the standpoint, I think the uh, Russians circumvented a number of the, the sanctions uh, obstacles uh, to take advantage of the U.S. pulling out of the JCPOA. At the same time, I think if some of these sanctions are removed on Iran, it will facilitate some more open deals, uh, not just with Russia, but also China and others. So, uh, you know, Russia and China are signatories to the deal, uh, but, uh, you know, they're going to play their own interests here. Uh, but um, I think we have seen that the Russians will try to take advantage of the, the wedges that they see, certainly in the Middle East, uh, that have developed as a result of some U.S. perceived missteps over the last decade or so, uh, improving relations uh, around the area. But I, I also think that, that China is a, is a player here, and um, China is, looks at Iran as an area for a further economic uh, development. Uh, and in terms of deals, they already have forged quite a few. Um, but uh, Russia is much more of a, just an opportunist and will, will do what they can uh, to, to take advantage of you know, the opportunities that come their way. Yes, I agree. I think it's worth talking about China just a bit. They are the bigger fish in this pond. And keep in mind that the Iranians and Chinese just uh, signed a 25-year uh, strategic deal, is what they call it. Um, a lot of it is hype. Um, it's unclear what uh, in it is, is uh, concrete, but the core of it is something we should keep our eye on. And that is that uh, the Chinese have committed to buying a lot of oil from Iran over these coming 25 years. And in exchange, uh, they will invest in Iran. So there is an economic deal there. There's also a military component to it. I haven't been able to find out any details about what it entails, and it may not be uh, mapped out yet, but I think we should keep our eye on that too. Interesting indeed. All right, Bill Pope, this is your moment. Thank you to both of you uh, for excellent presentations and, and answers to the questions, almost all of which, all the ones I have have already been asked in one way or another. But John, John, uh, uh, expressed some optimism about one of the questions I was going to ask. And that is uh, with future President Raisi, other hardliners, the Revolutionary Guard, uh, don't they see as much, you said you were optimistic and I hope you're right, but don't they see at least some advantages of continuing this hostility and not coming, coming back to a deal? You said uh, you were somewhat optimistic that they could be held in check. Do you agree on that? Well, I, I was picking up on Suzanne's optimism that the, the talks are going to result in some progress in the coming months. Uh, I, I do think that there is um, real incentives for Iran to find some way to get these sanctions um, reduced um, because it's just hurting them economically and it is putting political pressure you know, even on the hardliners. Um, so I, I, I do think that um, I, I am optimistic in that regard. Uh, I'm not all that optimistic that we're going to see a real change in Iranian behavior and malign activities in the region. As I pointed out, they have some real um, vested interests in what's going on inside of Iraq, inside of Syria, Lebanon, uh, Afghanistan, Yemen, other areas. And, and so they will continue with these malign activities and support for various uh, causes. Um, but I, I do think that getting this JCPOA or whatever back on track it really allows 
a, an opening for discussions on these other areas. And I, I think it, it will put some additional pressure on Iran to uh, not um, engage in outrageous activities that could in fact lead to a, another unwinding of the sanctions relief. Uh, so uh, right now, uh, Iran has seen over the last several years, you know, little reason to um, curtail some of its activities. Um, uh, but I do think that if we're able to get this deal back on track, uh, there will be increased pressure, um, both domestically as well as internationally on Iran, not only to adhere to the obligations of the, the new JCPOA, but also to um, scale back at least uh, some of the more um, outrageous activities that Iran has been involved in. So you're thinking Khamenei may uh, try to curta- uh, keep the pressure on the hardliners who might want to prevent this from coming back into play? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have insight uh, and I don't have access to current intelligence about the interaction between Khamenei and, and some of these individuals. As I said, Qasem Soleimani's departure, I think, was a blow to Khamenei. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, he does look upon Raisi as somebody who, uh, I guess, has the, the strength and the capability to uh, keep things moving in a, in a direction. Um, Khamenei has his own views, you know, uh, sometimes they're, they're hard line and sometimes they're not as hard line. I mean, he had to be convinced by Rouhani and others to sign on to this JCPOA. So, uh, again, I don't know what his current sort of mental acuity is and how attuned he is to what's going on on the streets in, in Iran and other areas. I just feel as though uh, Khamenei recognizes that the Biden administration is different than the Trump administration. And they may also have been a bit buoyed by uh, the Biden administration's criticisms of of Israel in terms of the recent uh, clashes in the Gaza Strip. uh, That um, again, Biden is not Trump and Biden doesn't have this um, just visceral hate uh, for Iran. Uh, that I think the Iranians perceived in Donald Trump. And so I think even the Raisis and others will see if they can capitalize on a, a, a more um, a favorable um, view in Washington today. Yeah, I'd like to just add a point about Raisi and the upcoming election, because I think it is important. Um, uh, yes, Iran is uh, a theocracy with some democratic fringe around it, And what we saw, I think, was quite extraordinary with the Guardian Council's decision to eliminate someone like Ali Larajani from running. I mean, he is an insider. He's a revolutionary insider. And they also um, did not allow Rouhani's vice president, Jahan Giri, to run either, who was part of this system. So what I see happening is um, this is the leader does not want to leave anything to chance. Uh, he wants Raisi to win. Uh, he wants the conservatives to consolidate their power at this moment. And the key reason is that, as John mentioned, uh, Hamenei is at an age where um, Iranian presidents usually serve two terms. And it is very likely that whoever is the next president of Iran will be president when Hamenei either passes away or becomes disabled to continue his role. So he wants someone there who is going to steer the ship uh, in a way that he wants to see fit. He doesn't want to see a reformer or even a moderate uh, be at the helm when that happens. So that is, I think, one of the key driving forces to what we're seeing play out. And again, this is a consolidation of the conservatives' power at this time. But one, one additional point, I also think that even with Raisi at the helm, there will be consistency and continuity on Iran's part with the JCPOA. They will want to return to it. They will want to adhere to it. For the reasons that John mentioned, uh, they need economic relief and they, they need it quite desperately. Not desperate enough that they're going to capitulate, but uh, desperate enough that they're going to return to the deal and reverse all the progress that they made on the new program. I want to thank both of you for an absolutely outstanding presentation today. We were so lucky. And I'm going to turn this over to our president, Jim Schmatter, to close up. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. It was just marvelous. Jim? Well, I add my uh, thanks in echoing Mimi. We really appreciate your being with us. One of the few upsides from this virtual world we've been living in for the past uh, months and months and months and months is that we're able to uh, 
have programs outside our usual season and we're able to bring I think a much more distinguished cast of individuals to speak to us. Although we'd love to have both of you come to Naples, Florida, which is not such a bad place in December. But in any case, we thank you. Uh, Iran, for more than 40 years now, maybe going back to 1953, even, even more, has been a relationship that's fraught for us. And the more we, we think about it, the more we learn about it, the more hopefully we can make progress through uh, at this point, the JCPOA. So we, uh, Suzanne, John, thank you so much for being with us. Well, I want to say thank you to Mimi and Jim and the council, and also thanks to Suzanne. And also a special note to Suzanne. Suzanne is you know, the type of person who really helps to push these issues forward and supports government efforts and frequently behind the scenes and not to fanfare. But uh, Suzanne, I want to thank you for what you've done over the years. And I'm so glad that you're staying so current on Iran because we really need people like you to continue to empower those that have the responsibility to try to make sure we keep this country safe and strong. So again, thank you everyone for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you so much. Let me say that meant a lot to me, John. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi, Jim, the whole council. So this has been great. Thank you so much and have a wonderful summer. I hope it's going to be a summer filled with some good news for all of us. You're so pink. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Now. Bye.